Okay boys, the objective is simple. Create a short film. ETA for launch, 21 days. We begin by constructing a story. The scene is set in a post-apocalyptic world where a soldier fights the machines. He's tormented by the memories of his battles in the past. A machine fires a rocket towards him which he dodges and fires his own RPG, destroying the machine. He ultimately wins the fight with the machines and finds peace in the nature. Our character is Bolith, the pyromaniac, and he's carrying his special RPG with a tactical nuke. He's doing the dodge maneuver to evade the missile. This movement is mapped onto him from Mixamo. The machine will be a massive mech that we kid bash together. The original concept includes the mech, but due to difficulties down the line, we'll eventually dismantle it to scavenge it for its parts. Up to it. Take my parts. For now, we stick with the concepts and try and make a simple rig for its movement. When putting together environments like these, cloth simulations can be infinitely valuable to add more to the story and can be used in a number of ways. For this purpose, I've made Cascade. This is my own library of high quality real time cloth simulations with drag and drop functionality. I analyzed hundreds of animation to put this library together. I use it myself regularly and you can check it out at Blender Market. So for the environment, we put together a set of mega scan assets and color correct them with hue saturation and curves adjustment to make them all cohesive. With these assets, we begin the assembly of our environment. Using the concept that we previously sketched out, we lay out assets in the same configuration, making a pathway between the forest. As we set these out, it's a good practice to classify your environment elements into various categories for us to quickly grab and drag and drop. So to make a transition from land to water, we know that we can use these transition rocks that we have classified. Now to make this landscape a bit more interesting, we'll subdivide the plane and use the grab brush in the sculpt mode to give it a shape of a valley. In our main camera view, it also serves as a good tool for composition as leading lines, as these lines guide the eye towards the action. In the middle, we get distracted by Stuka dive bombers and their aerobatics, but we quickly regain our focus and add an abandoned building in our environment. This will add another set of leading lines for good composition for our shot. To add some depth and parallax with camera movement, we place these tall buildings far off in the distance. This is the city ruled by the machines, the sewers of which drain into the stream. From the Megascans library, we can get a barrel and connect multiple barrels to form a pipe and then place a deformed barrel as a prop. Now to add the destroyed military equipment, we add a medivac helicopter, which I scan myself using Gorilla photo scanning technique. I particularly like photo scans because of their rich textures and ease of use, especially in non-deforming models. As a bonus tip, if you bunch together some photo scans and light them up with an HDRI, the scene will look pretty realistic. We then place a destroyed tank on the side to give a little bit of visual weight on the left side as well. The last piece of military hardware will be a destroyed APC, just near the camera. When the core models are set in place, we should make a point to add random props here and there to make the scene lift in and tell a deeper story. Imagine people abandoning this place and leaving their equipment behind. Now to add the forest, we use a handy add-on called Botanic. It's my go-to add-on for all the vegetation needs and we'll use the weight paint feature to distribute the foliage on either side of the stream. We can change the arrangement by changing the seed value and find what we like. If there is one common feature of all post-apocalyptic environments that I particularly like, it's the moss. So to set the base, we crudely blend in a moss material using noise as the factor in almost all of the environment assets. Now to add another level of depth, we use a geonode system called IVGen. This is great for adding a tangible surface foliage, further enhancing our post-apocalyptic vibe. We can easily drag it anywhere and it latches onto the parts of the model, according to the parameters that we've set, including the density, distribution, etc. This really sells it for us, so we place it everywhere to our heart's desire including the APC and the tank. We can then add some low-lying foliage on the ground on either side of the stream with the same weight paint method. If we look at the barrel of the tank, it appears a bit off. That's because it wasn't scanned adequately in the first place. And because the barrel is such an iconic part of the tank, we'll take our time to reconstruct it. We'll use boolean to delete it and since it'll be covered by moss anyway, we can get away with the same pipe that we made for the sewers and make it into a barrel. Now here comes the big problem when we start to animate. Remember when we mentioned that we'll salvage the mech for its parts? Now is the time. 
It so happened that I was just not happy with the animation and it felt like a loose link in the chain. So, change of plans. We download the drone model just for its animation and we use parts of the mech to make its body. We see one issue with the animation. It does not show enough inertia. As a rule of thumb, the more massive the things are, the slower they respond to an external force. And if we compare the size of the drone to the size of the soldier, we can see that the mech is pretty huge. So when the missile hits, it should be only a tiny movement of conveying the transfer of momentum of the missile. So this is one important thing that you can use to convey the scale of the objects while animating. Since the drone falls after the hit, we can try some jujitsu with the curves to modulate the speed of the fall. For reference, here is how different curves are translated into animations. We then start to dismantle the mech and salvage its parts. One must sacrifice in order for the other to survive. We tear it down part by part and retrofit the entire thing with these salvaged parts. We can then parent these salvaged parts to the original mesh and disable the original mesh in the rendered view. This effectively maps the original animation to the salvaged geometry. So by comparison, we have this. Now to make the missile impact, we need to trace the trajectory of the projectile in all possible moments of launch. For that we make a cylinder extending from the tip of the rocket and parent it to the rocket itself. This traces the impact site on the drone at all times in a straight trajectory. This serves as a good guide to animate the position of the rocket. Now to make the drone destruction, we select the part we need to get disintegrated with the impact, triangulate it and separate it out. Then we apply a quick explode effect and adjust the number of particles this part gets destroyed into. Next, we make two smoke simulations in Embergen. One is the primary blast, and the second is a trailing smoke from when the drone falls to the ground. For the primary blast, we use this simulation preset and we don't have to work too hard on this. We can export it as a VDB and import it in Blender. When working with Embergen, I always recommend seeing any presets that fit with your requirement, and we can go on from there. For the trailing animation, we'll require a custom simulation. We import the destroyed drone as a collider object in the node setup along with its animation as an FBX. The emitter is placed inside the collision mesh and animated to move with it. This billows the smoke out from the frontal, destroyed part of the mesh and looks fairly reasonable. One notable thing is that during rendering, we will need to render out these separately. Because these VDBs are overlapping, cycles in its current state do not support rendering of the overlapping VDBs. To make the rocket exhaust gases, we add a circular emitter object at the rear end and make it as an emitter for the particle system. The particles will be a collection of three metaballs converted into a mesh and given a displacement modifier. Then given a volume shader, when accumulated in enough numbers in a particle system, this is a highly controllable smoke system. This is how it will look in the rendered view. The exhaust is a rocket exhaust video mapped onto a solid. We fit similar rocket systems in the drone that our soldier dodges and give the same particle system for the rocket exhaust that we made earlier. The rockets need to have a rotational stabilizing motion when they're fired, which maintains their trajectory and speed. In order to do this, we parent the rocket to an empty placed at the center of its tip and give rotation to the empty. This gives us independent control over the rotational motion. For the impact blast, we set up a volume shader and set the black body intensity to 5 and temperature to 5000. This gives appropriate flames to the blast rather than just an overwhelming smoke. Before we set the lighting, we give the entire environment a volume shader. Volume adds atmospheric imperfections and much needed depth. But there are two ways to go about it. You can either give an atmospheric volume in the scene itself, which will strikingly increase your render times, or you can add fog elements in the post-production stage. Whichever way you tilt towards, the point is to use volume or haziness in your environment scenes. As a rule of thumb, the farther you go away from camera, the haziness increases. And this haziness is often with a blue tint. We've already blocked out lighting using an HDRI, and that gives a diffuse light. But to really tailor the lighting in the scene, we'll use some additional lights to highlight some areas and subdue the others. For this purpose, we use a spotlight to light specific areas that we need the viewer's focus to go towards. The main character is our soldier, so we add a spotlight from the direction of the HDRI and give it some intensity for the main character to stand out from the environment. We also have a sun lamp to enhance the directionality of light and make the highlights a bit sharper, especially on the metallic parts. 
since the HDRI costs a relatively diffuse light. Now our second point of interest is the drone. We have another spotlight lighting the rim of the rotors and this makes the lighting a bit more interesting. We use a small light from the opposite side to lift up some areas of shadows and a rim light at the back to separate the drone from the forest, especially because both of these elements have similar colours. We also add a light to highlight the destroyed armour to further enhance the midground. The destroyed armour is a crucial element in telling the story that we are constructing. The way I want you to think about lighting is that it's the mastery over the control of the shadows. Once you're confident in controlling where the shadows go, your scenes will immediately look more interesting. One neat trick to further enhance the depth of your scenes is to add a large light blocker just behind the camera. Light coming from the direction of the camera makes the scene look flat. So if you eliminate it or give it a gradual fade like we did here, it adds a flare of mystique. For the sky, we use a sky image from Unsplash. They have high quality sky images that you can use as your backgrounds. To make the sky a bit more dynamic, we rotate the sky at 45 degrees and give it some parallax as the camera moves. We animate the top two vertices of the plane a little towards right using the shape keys. To add multiple cameras to the scene for multiple shots, we use a simple camera rig which I always use. It's a camera with a track to constraint parented to an empty. This is included in my free Blender startup file linked in the description. We make multiple copies of this according to the number of shots. We then select an empty, set the 3D cursor to our point of interest, press Shift S and select Selection to Cursor. Then we can adjust the camera distance from the subject, the angle that we want and then setting the camera movement. Then it's only a matter of setting up the rest of the shots in a similar way. Set up the compositor if you want to do some post-processing. And after rendering, here is the final result. We are clear to engage. Time on target, five mics, out. We, must get we have engaged. Coming near. Biological threats north. Visual on the enemy there. Incision at five. Out of the Fall kill. This was completely made in 3D, but what if we could add CGI elements on a live action footage in a way that looks completely realistic and seamless? The next video will take you through the entire process. I'll see you there. Until then, farewell.